بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين سيدنا ونبينا ومولانا محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين رب شرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل الأقدة من لساني يفقه قولي سبحانك لا علم لنا إلا ما علمتنا إنك أنت العليم الحكيم اللهم علمنا ما ينفعنا وزدنا علما آمين برحمتك يا أرحم الراحمين السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته All praise and thanks are due solely to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Traces peace, blessings and salutations upon our master and exemplar Nabi Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam On this blessed day of Jumu'ah We ask that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us all goodness and blessings throughout our lives and our families And may we live our lives correctly in the right way and only only pursuing that which is halal and avoiding all of that which is haram and may Allah grant us the tawfiq to do that uh, in every aspect of our lives today specifically we look at the importance of one's food and drink this is the second lesson in the course living right halal and haram according to the shafi'i school of thought and this lesson is of course critically important as any Muslim would know because Islam is very very particular about what we consume so to commence we look at this particular narration that Sheikh Noah Hamim Keller presents in the beginning of the chapter of Halal and Haram in the Reliance of the Traveller which is his translation of the classical Shafi'i text Umdatu Salik wa Uddatu Nasik and his reference for this particular narration is a secondary source, which is Riyadh al-Salihin. I'm sure we'd be familiar with it. With the Sahabi Anas ibn Malik, radiallahu ta'ala anhu, may Allah be pleased with him, relates that the Prophet, alayhi salatu wasalam, found a date in his path. And then he said, but for fear that it was charity, I would have eaten it. In other words, if I hadn't feared that this date was charity, I would have consumed it. Now, it's very important that we understand the context of this particular narration. The Prophet ﷺ is not permitted by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to consume charity, to consume zakah. So, zakah and sadaqah, this is not permitted for the Prophet ﷺ and his family. This is a well known uh, aspect of our law. It's well documented in the madahib, etc. And there's no doubt about this. Then the other context that we should know about is the Ahlul Bayt, they hold a very special place within Islam and that is the family of the Prophet ﷺ in that they are supposed to receive a share of, of, of the Baytul Mal. Right? A stipulated share of the Baytul Mal is dedicated for the family of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. But not charity, not zakah. So in light of this, Right in, in light of this narration, we may ask, so why is the Prophet wasallam assuming that it could be charity? Is this the approach that we should be taking? So there's a lot that we can learn from this hadith. So I'm going to refer to the commentary of uh, Sheikh Noah in this regard. But his commentary is actually, you know, he's, he's relating commentary from another scholar, Muhammad Ibn, uh, Muhammad, I think it's Ibn Atayil al-Bakri, uh, where he says, the hadith shows that when a person doubts that something is permissible, he should not do it. In another narration, it says, Rasulullah said in various narrations, but this is an example thereof, if you have doubt, then leave that which causes you doubt and rather go for that which causes you no doubt because... Truthfulness causes contentment, while lies causes doubt. Now the question arises, and I'll bring the commentary on the screen, and we are reading from the second line. The question arises, is refraining from it in such a case obligatory or recommended? To which our imams explicitly reply that it is the latter, it is recommended. Because the thing is initially assumed to be permissible, 
and fundamentally not blameworthy as long as some prior reason for considering, for considering it unlawful is not known about it that, one, that one's doubts has been removed. For example, when one doubts that one of the conditions for valid slaughtering has been met, conditions which make a particular piece of meat lawful, the assumption is that it remains unlawful since initially the animal was alive, a state, a state in which it is unlawful to eat. While it only becomes lawful by a specific procedure, that is, Islamic slaughtering, so that the meat does not become lawful except through certainty that it has been slaughtered according to Islam's laws. The case of meat is exceptional in this, since most other foods are initially permissible, and one assumes they remain so unless one is certain something has occurred which has made them unlawful. This is a very, very important point. When it comes to meat products, right, anything that is meat, a meat product or a byproduct of meat, the initial isam, uh, excuse me, the initial initial assumption is that the product is unlawful, because the meat product can only become lawful through shari slaughtering. So you need to know that it's been through shari slaughtering for it to be considered lawful. But this is specifically with regards to meat and meat byproducts. When it comes to non-meat products, most non-meat products, for example, um, something that's pastry-based or cake-based or uh, savory-based, etc. If there's, if there's no um, obvious meat byproduct, then the in initial assumption is that it is lawful. What else do we learn from this hadith? In cases of doubt, only likely possibilities are taken into consideration. We don't look at every possibility, only likely possibilities, in other words, what we call probabilities. Since it appears probable <coughs> in the above hadith that dates for charity were present at the time, this is the only reason the Prophet ﷺ hesitated to eat of the dates, because there was, in fact, some dates there, and the date was for charity, and therefore he has reasonable um, probability that this could be from charity. The Prophet ﷺ, as for remote possibilities, taking them into consideration only leads to a blameworthy extremism. And I see this uh, within our communities in the world today. You would find at some places um, of dining that you'd find straws with halal certification on it. You would find toothpicks with halal certification on it. Bottled water with halal certification on it. It really becomes ridiculous okay um, this is blameworthy extremism in my humble opinion and a departure from how the early muslims were for the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam was given some cheese and a cloak uh, by members of a non-muslim arab tribe he ate of the cheese and he wore the cloak without considering that maybe they mixed the former with pork or wine or maybe perhaps the wool came from a slaughtered or unslaughtered animal. This was not his approach. Were one to take such possibilities into consideration at every instance, one would not find anything lawful on the face of the earth. This is why our colleagues say complete certainty that something is lawful is only conceivable about rainwater falling from the sky into one's own hands. This is taken from Dalilul Falihin. A sharh of the uh, very well-known compilation of a hadith by Imam Nawawi called Riyad al-Salihin. So this sets the this sets the stage for the discussion. We need to be very careful about what we consume. It's 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 a vital part of the interaction of the life of a believer. We also know that the risk of consuming unlawful is that one's prayers would not be accepted, one's du'as would not be accepted, one's flesh may just become, you know, unlawful in the sense that it needs to burn clean, la hawla wa la quwata illa billahi al -al in the fires of Jahannam. None of us would want that. But at the same time, we also need to know that this, this type of extremism, we, we want to be guaranteed that something is halal, even though it's, it's fruit, or it's a fruit salad, for example, or um, it's a pack of biscuits. It's, it's, it's going to make life unbearable 
And this type of difficulty is not the function of Islam. Right? Allah does not reveal the Quran or the Sunnah or Islam in general to make life difficult. Not for the Prophet ﷺ, not for the Sahaba and not for us. And some people, especially those who are not educated in the rules of halal and haram, as we will discuss here today, may easily fall into this because they, they do know it's very easy to understand the seriousness of consuming haram, but it's not very easy to understand the, the detailed rulings about what actually is halal and haram. And once we understand this and we apply this, we would be able to definitively be guided in our lives as far as what we, what we believe to be lawful and what we believe to be unlawful. And then we wouldn't have as many cases of doubt you know, about something. Um, and I hope that, that this makes uh, abundant sense to you because we are taking this from the precedent, both precedents of the Prophet. On the one hand, he had reason to believe that the dates were from charitable sources and therefore impermissible for him to consume, so he left it. But on the other hand, he didn't ask the non Muslims who gave him the cheese what's in this cheese, what's the ingredients, um, who made it. Where did they get the money from to purchase the ingredients or to make the cheese? Whose cow was it? What did the cow eat from? They, he didn't ask about the clothes. Um, you know, it wasn't gold and it wasn't silk. So the Prophet ﷺ accepted it and he wore it. So he said, والسلام, in his acceptance, he, or rather he didn't say in his acceptance, you know, I have an objection to this, I have an objection to that. Can you figure out, is this from an unslaughtered animal, etc.? The Prophet ﷺ's approach was, this isn't obviously haram, so therefore the initial status quo that it is halal should be presumed to be valid. Right? This is a concept known as istishab. Something remains pure, something remains halal until proven otherwise. The exception to that rule is with meat and meat byproducts. Right? And Allah knows best. So now we move into some text. There are certain principles in understanding halal and haram. This is taken from Fiqh al-Manhaji, a contemporary work of Shafi'i Fiqh. And these principles are taken from a few verses of the Qur'an. So let's look at the verses. قول الله عز وجل قل لا أجد فيما أوحي إلي محرما على طاعم يطعمه إلا أن يكون ميتة أو دما مسفوحا أو لحم خنزير فإنه رجس أو فسقا أهل لغير الله به فمن اضطر غير باغ ولا عاد فإن ربك غفور رحيم And that is in Surah Al-An'am verse number 145 Say to them, O Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam I do not find in that which was revealed unto me anything impermissible uh, for the one who consumes it except that it be carrion so an unslaughtered animal O Daman Masfuhan, O flowing blood, O Lahma, Khinzirin, O the flesh of swine, Fainahu Rijasun, this is filth, O Fiskan, O sinful, O Hilla Lirairi Lahibi, O something that has been sacrificed for other than the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So in those instances, Famanitur Rahir Abarin, anyone who is coerced because of circumstances, because of desperation, etc., starvation, if they are coerced, not desirous of, of the haram material, nor going overboard in how much they consume, then Allah is most forgiving, most merciful. And this basically means if you find yourself in a situation where there's literally nothing else to eat except something impermissible, like the flesh of swine, then you must actually consume of it, but you shouldn't be desirous of it, nor should you go over the extent of what is required to uh, to keep yourself alive and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. The next verse. Qawluhu subhanahu wa ta'ala wa yuhillu lahum al-tayyibat Allah made halal for them, the believers, the pure things, the good things. Wa yuharrimu alayhim al and he made unlawful for them the harmful things, the filthy things. This is in Surah Al-A'raf, verse number 157. And the next uh, ayah, They ask you, O Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, what has been made permissible for them? Qul, say to them, The pure, wholesome, excellent, good things. Surah Al-Ma'idah, verse number 4. So, 
in the Strong Believer course that we ran previously, and this is still accessible on the Seekers Guidance uh, platform, we learned that we shouldn't only be concerned with halal, because a lot of people are. Most Muslims would be concerned with what is halal, what, what type of food would they eat, is it halal? But we should also be very concerned with the tayyibat, wholesomeness, good, pure, um, wholesome foods. So we've covered the tayyibat aspect in the Strong Believer course, but this course, Living Right, Halal and Haram, is specifically aimed at teaching us about how to determine halal and haram and how to live one's life correctly by those rulings. So with that in mind, we look at the principles as set out in Fiqhul Manaji about what exactly is halal and haram. And by understanding these principles and learning them well, we would be able to navigate by ourselves uh, between what is halal and haram. So the first principle, al-mabda al-awwal. Kullu hayawanin istatabat wal-arabu fi hal al-khasab wal-rafahiyya fi asri nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam fahuwa halalun. Basically what it comes down to is the foods that were consumed by the people of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and in his time, those foods are considered to be halal. And these are the meat products um, that is that is basically considered to be halal. You've got some pictures on there just for, for the ease of learning. Um, but to be more text specific, it is permissible to eat the oryx, zebra, hyena, fox, rabbit, porcupine, and the daman, which is a Syrian rock badger, the deer, ostrich, or horse. These are specifically mentioned because they are not obvious. <laughs> In fact, they are the opposite of obvious. One would assume many of these things, if you don't know, you would assume them to be problematic to consume, especially the hyena, because it would be akin to a dog, for example, or the, um, the horse, right? People are surprised when, when they come to discover that... Um, these things are permissible to consume. But this is the first principle. So generally, livestock such as uh, cows, sheep, uh, chickens, rabbits, goats, etc. We all understand that if they are slaughtered correctly, they are permissible. We understand the issue about aquatic animals. We'll get to that in a moment. Camels, I think most Muslims also know that you know it's permissible to consume camel meat. But then there are certain less obvious matters that we do not necessarily understand or immediately believe to be, to be halal. So that's the first point of discussion. Then the second principle, al-mabda athani, the second principle is, وَيُحَرِّمُ مِنَ السِّبَاعِ كُلُّ مَا لَهُ نَابٌ قَوِيٌ يَفْتَرِسُ بِهِ what is haram of predatory animals are those animals, those predatory animals which and they either have fangs or they have, um, what do we call this? They hunt by fangs or tusks, right, which are strong. So they specifically hunt or defend themselves or attack with fangs or tusks. This is a general principle that we can, that we can use to understand what is impermissible. Kal, kalb, like the dog. Wal khinzir, the pig. Wal dhib, and the wolf, right? These are just some examples. They, there are many, but the point is understand the principle. I don't want to read uh, all the 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 detailed um, lists because it can go on and on, right? We can add and this and that, but this is a general principle. If the animal hunts with fangs or with talons or with tusks, then consider that animal to be impermissible, especially because it's a predatory animal. There are exceptions to this. We'll get to the exceptions. Uh, in, an, in a moment, in the but this would include the tiger, the bear, the monkey, even the elephant, right? The elephant doesn't strictly hunt with the tusks, but it uses its tusks for self-defense, for fighting with other elephants, etc. So by utilizing this principle, we can understand how to navigate uh, what is halal and haram about animals or among animals. Then the third principle, al-mabda al-thalith. وَيُحَرِّمُ كُلُّ حَيَوَانٍ نُدِبَ قَتْلُهُ So generally there are some animals which are considered to be dangerous and possibly life-threatening. 
Um, and there are a hadith that, that encourage, you know, the extermination of, of certain types of dangerous animals. So when it comes to those animals who pose a danger or harm to society and to humankind, such as the snake, the scorpion, the crow, um, even the rat, right, or, or vermin in general, anything that its harm can be well established, then those animals are also unlawful to consume, right? So it's haram to eat the harmful types of animals. Then again from Umda to Salik, uh, I want to share this chapter. It says, it is unlawful to eat, just to reiterate the points, right? Any form of pork products, cats or disgusting small animals that creep or walk on the ground, such as ants, flies and the like. Disgusting being used here to exclude inoffensive ones, such as the jerboa, the locust, and hedgehog, even porcupines, which are small creeping animals but are recognized as wholesome and pure. Maybe not to us and to our culture, but again, this was in consideration of what was normal for the people of the Prophet and those first recipients of the Qur'an. Then, predatory animals that prey with fangs or tusks, such as the lion, lynx, leopard, wolf, bear, simians, and so forth, including the elephant and the weasel, that is impermissible to eat as well. Number four, those which hunt with talons, such as the falcon, hawk, kite, or crow, except for the barnyard crow, which may be eaten. And then number five, the offspring of an animal permissible to eat, when it's mixed with an animal, not permissible to eat, such as a mule, which is a cross between one eaten, the horse, and one not eaten, the donkey. It is, okay, by the way, you saw earlier the picture of the zebra. Now in Arabic, the zebra is called the wild donkey, right? It's called the wild donkey. And if you look at the zebra, it does somewhat look like a, a, a technical donkey. So the zebra is considered permissible, but the donkey, the domesticated donkey, is not considered permissible to consume. Then it is permissible to eat any aquatic game, Sayyid al-Bahr as the Qur'an refers to it, except frogs and crocodiles, which are amphibious. So if there's an animal that is amphibious, it lives both inside and outside the water, then that animal is considered problematic, but any aquatic game, any aquatic animals, any fish in the sea, in the Shafi school of thought, um, is considered to be halal. So one need not ask, well, what about this type of fish and what about that type of fish? If it's a fish that cannot live for a prolonged period of time, and I'm not speaking about, for example, the, the lobster can remain outside of the water for an extended period of time at something like a day or two or some I don't know the exact details but even then it will eventually die because it needs the water whereas the frog and the crocodile could potentially live on and on I don't know to what extent but they could live for an extremely long period of time outside of the water so amphibious creatures are not permissible to consume but any aquatic animals they are permissible to consume in the Shafi'i Madhab there are some distinguishing factors in other Madhahib uh, so anyone interested can do the Living Right Halal and Haram course for the Hanafi School of Thought, uh, also available on the Seeker's Guidance platform. Then, what about other substances? Now, beyond animals and uh, living substances, it is unlawful to eat anything harmful, such as poison, glass, earth, dirt, in other words. If it is proven to be harmful, it is unlawful, because Allah says, وَيُحَرِّمُ عَلَيْهِمُ الْخَبَائِثِ He made the the impermissible, the filthy things, the harmful things, unlawful them, for them to consume. Similarly, it is, it is unlawful to eat anything impure, najasa, whether it is impure in itself or because of being affected with something impure, as is the case with milk or vinegar or honey or something of the sort that was, that was uh, contaminated perhaps by insects, perhaps by... Um, some excrement matter etc because no liquid can be purified except water water can be purified by adding more water to it until it reaches a certain amount and then it's pure again or purifying again but any other type of liquid the moment it becomes um, contaminated it remains impure it is also unlawful to eat substances which are pure but generally considered repulsive 
right? It's, it's not normal uh, behavior. It's not normal human behavior to consume like saliva or sperm. So in the Shafi'i school of thought, sperm, mani, is considered to be tahir, right? But that doesn't mean one can go about uh, eating sperm for whatever reason. Uh, that would be considered unlawful even though it is tahir. Then the other principle that we learned from the Quran itself was that if you, from an itturra, whosoever is coerced into consuming something unlawful, whether it be because of uh, thirst, so there's khamr available and that's the only thing, or whether it be because of starvation and there's khinzir available and that's the only thing. So if forced to eat from an unslaughtered dead animal out of fear of losing one's life or fear of an illness growing worse, then one may eat enough, uh, the necessary minimum, to avert destruction, meaning enough to keep life from ending. One may not, uh, one may not to, you know, do so to the extent that is, it's now a feast, right? So, okay, I have to eat khinzir, there's nothing else to eat, so I'm going to really enjoy it. That is, that is not uh, allowed. And one is also not allowed to overindulge. So in order to stay alive, I need to eat a little bit. But instead, I fill myself up. That is impermissible as well. And Allah knows uh, best. So then we ask, okay, so after learning the basics of halal and haram, and this, by the way, is not touching on how to slaughter. That's, that's a discussion. Dhabh is, is a discussion in and of itself, uh, a more technical discussion where we speak about the food pipe and the air pipe needing to be severed and the treatment of the animal and so on. There's a lot of sunan uh, about that and that the animal needs to be slaughtered in the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, uh, that it is recommended to say bismillah before the animal is slaughtered. That's just in terms of the procedure of slaughtering. What was discussed up until this point is in terms of you know, considering halal slaughtering, which animals would be permissible and which animals would not. So in other words, you can't go take a monkey, sacrifice it in a halal manner. So you say bismillah and you sever the necessary arteries and the necessary pipes and then say, well, it was slaughtered in a halal way, so it's halal. No, it doesn't work that way. It just as, as much as it doesn't work by way of, of consuming haram and then thinking that one could simply say bismillah and uh, it's fine. No, it doesn't work that way. But why all this discussion? Why does it matter whether our food is halal and haram? We, we indicated to this at the beginning, so let's look at this in greater detail now. The main narration that we need to be really worried about, uh, as far as I'm concerned, is that of Abu Huraira radiallahu ta'ala anhu, who reported that Allah's messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, who said, O oh people, Allah is good and he therefore accepts only that which is good. And Allah commanded the believers as he commanded the messengers by saying, O messengers, eat of the good things and do good deeds. Verily, I am aware of what you do. And he said, subhanahu wa ta'ala, O those who believe, eat of the good things that we gave you. Right? We mentioned some of these verses at the start. He then made a mention of a person who travels widely, his hair disheveled, and is covered with dust. He lifts his hand towards the sky and thus makes the supplication, Ya Rabbi, Ya Rabbi, O Lord, O Lord. Now the picture being painted here by the Prophet wasallam is that of a person whose prayer one expects to be mustajab. A person who travels widely. Is the dua of the traveler not mustajab? A person whose whose traveling has put them through so much difficulty that their hair becomes disheveled and they are covered with dust. Is it not that a believer, when faced with any form of difficulty, the dua becomes mustajab? So the, the context and the depiction of this, the description of this person by the Prophet wasallam is of one whom we would expect that Allah would answer this application very readily. But this is not the case. They lift up their hands and they say, Ya Rabb, Ya Rabb, Oh Allah, Oh Allah, please, please. Whereas, his diet is unlawful, his drink is unlawful, and his clothes are unlawful, and his nourishment is unlawful. How can this, how can then his supplication be accepted? In other words, 
how with these situations can his supplication be accepted? Subhanallah. Now this is not the person who generally is conscious of what they consume and whether it is halal and haram, but somehow, without this person's knowledge, something haram crept in uh, along the food chain or along the line, or there was some contamination that took place that he's got no control over nor any knowledge about. That is not this person. This is someone who has no concern or very little concern over what they eat. So they would eat something deliberately that is halal, uh, that is haram. They would drink something deliberately that is haram, and they're not really concerned about it. The Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, when consuming cheese or accepting the clothing from non-Muslims, he could have become, as some people do today, very, very meticulous about what the origin of the cheese happens to be. Who touched it? Uh, was this person's hands washed? Right? What container was it was it kept in? Perhaps it was a container that was used to keep khamr in. Okay? The the money that the cow was purchased with, from whom the milk was taken, the process used, was it the natural process? Did they have any additives that they that they added in there? Okay. Um the person who gave him the, the garment that the Prophet والسلام, wore, it was a, a woolen garment, but where did the wool come from? Was the sheep slaughtered? Was it, was it unslaughtered? Who slaughtered the sheep? Who purchased the, the sheep? Was the sheep purchased with halal money from the income of a halal job? Um, was it a Muslim? Was it a non-Muslim? When the sheep was slaughtered, was the sheep slaughtered in the name of Allah? The dye that was used to, to, to dye the wool, was there any alcohol utilized in that? Although that wasn't maybe as prevalent at that time. But we don't find this from Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Is cheese generally halal? Yes. Is wool generally permissible to wear? Yes. The Prophet ﷺ accepted it. When he had reason to doubt, he stayed away. Because leave that which causes you doubt and rather go for that which causes you no doubt. That is the teaching of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Should we be concerned about halal and haram in terms of what we consume? A hundred percent, absolutely. But should we be more concerned than the Sharia actually holds us to account for? Absolutely not. Because then we would make following the Sharia more difficult. And the alternative would be to discard the Sharia and just carry on with life as we so please. And that would be our destruction. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala save us, grant us to live lives of righteousness, lives that uh, are facilitated towards that which is right, and away from that which is haram. May Allah grant us all the goodness, khair and barakah. Jazakumullah khairan. Until next time, inshallah, wa sallallahu ala sayyidina Muhammad. Subhanallahi wa bihamdi. Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdik. Nashadu wa la ilaha illa anta. Nastaghfiruka wa natubu